So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Colin Barker, who is going to uh, educate us about uh, transcatheter techniques for repair and replacement, state of the art. Dr. Barker. All right. I learned something interesting last night. Does anyone know what the Scotland Stone is? The what? Scotland Stone. The stone. The Scotland, did you say? The Stone of Scone. The Scotland Stone. Does anyone watch the Olympics? There's a, sp there's a sport where you throw rocks down the ice uh, that's called curling. And, and the, uh, the Scotland Stone is the uh, ball, and it weighs 42 pounds. I was pretty impressed with that last night um, as I was putting this together. So uh, I'm gonna t I was actually also honored to see a mitral clip picture in your talk, Dr. Lowry. Thank you very much. <laughs> It, didn't, it only took about 15 years, but thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about percutaneous repair um, as an interventional cardiologist. Obviously, uh, I have a bias towards this procedure. Um, the, the topics I'll highlight are, one, the essential need for multimodality imaging, some of the where we are now, some of the limitations that we have as far as doing percutaneous procedures in the cath lab, and where we may be in the future, hopefully. Um, I'll highlight the options right now we have for transcatheter mitral valve repair, which is the mitral clip, but also highlight some of the newer modalities that will be um, coming through primarily in clinical trials. And lastly, the transcatheter mitral valve replacement uh, era or arena, which is fairly limited right now. We have experience with one um, that I'll show you some cases on, but really the transcatheter mitral valve replacement uh, process has actually been going on longer than the TAVR process, but really isn't there yet clinically, as we all know, and I think because of several limitations that I'll highlight. So multimodality imaging is essential. We can't, as Dr. Lowry gets direct exposure uh, to the mitral valve, we, and when I say we, it's Steve Little and myself here, um, have to work together. You know, he's the eyes on the hands as a team to do these procedures. And he has to be able to provide me the images to know where to put the devices in my hands. And there's a whole dialogue that we had to uh, create. But essentially, it doesn't just, it's not just the echocardiogram and the physical exam that makes the diagnosis. We know we get someone referred for mitral regurgitation. But then sometimes, as, as Deepin has shown, we need a CMR to sort of better quantify it in the pre-procedural planning phase. But frequently now, particularly for transcatheter mitral valve replacement, as you'll see, we need a CAT scan to give us some idea of what's the potential sizing as well as what potential effect could a device have in there as far as problems. And then when it comes to actually doing the procedure, it's primarily guided by echocardiography. But now, as I'll highlight, we have some uh, fusion processes we can do in the cath lab with fluoroscopy using the CAT scan that we got in part of the pre-procedural planning. So it's this whole complex array of pre-procedural imaging that's usually echo, CMR, plus or minus CT. And then we do some, sometimes some modeling, particularly in the TMVR uh, uh, cases of, of putting the valve in in the CT and seeing how it's going to have an effect. Obviously, fluoroscopy is our driver in the cath lab. The, the thing we're most used to using as far as doing procedures. But for the structural heart interventions, 3D echo has really uh, made a huge difference. I mean, when I, I did my first mitral clip in 2005 um, when I was a fellow, and the fellow who used to have to do it drew the short straw because this was like a six or seven hour procedure guided by uh, 2D transesophageal echo. And the other person who drew the short straw was the echo fellow because it was just two of us there uh, sweating it out, um, watching uh, at the time this was Jim Slater at NYU trying to uh, grab this leaflet for hours and hours and hours, and usually um, pretty painful. But as soon as 3D TEE came along, I mean, we average about 30 minutes right now um, for a mitral clip from transeptal time to uh, closure, and I think still hold the record of doing a case in six minutes. Um, so with 3D TEE, it's really become a very simple, fairly uh, easy to do procedure. Here's an example. <laughs> so here's an example of our workflow. Um, not exactly, not a, a mitral repair, but this was a PVL closure showing how we get the uh, CT pre-procedural planning. We highlight some things. We've used CT to also guide our transeptal puncture. We'll do a uh, 2D, 3D image fusion uh, with CT and then overlay the images onto the uh, fluoro screen. 
And here you can see it, it, this is another case of a uh, PVL closure where again, this used to take several hours of sort of poking around blindly with some echo guidance, but we realized that echo can have some limitations as far as identifying uh, the lesion or the hole. But with CT fluorofusion, we can literally put a dot on the screen and I can put the wire there. And again, this can just take several minutes rather than several hours. So for percutaneous repair, this is it right now. This is, this is the uh, system that's approved in the United States. We've done uh, almost 150 cases. The problem with the mitral clip is it's not, it's not the right choice for everyone. Probably about 50% of the cases were referred. We turned down and we've learned which cases are gonna um, you know, be a successful mitral clip versus those which are not. But at this point, the ones that we do select have a fairly uh, good outcome. And I went back and, and dug up a case because I, this guy came in uh, just this week for his three-year follow-up. Um, this is a 64-year-old guy referred from MD Anderson who had a brain tumor uh, that needed urgent surgery, had pulmonary hypertension, and had a uh, flail P2, um, which you can clearly see here. And they were, he wasn't moderately symptomatic, but uh, really the pulmonary hypertension saying with surgery was the concern. Uh, so we went ahead and treated him with a mitral clip after our uh, multidisciplinary discussion. And after the first clip went in, there was a fair amount of residual mitral regurgitation. So we put in a second clip, which uh, almost eliminated the MR and brought his PA pressures down to normal. He got his surgery, and this was uh, three years ago. Um, and he just came to clinic last Thursday, uh, still doing well. Um, so we, we're, we're comfortable with it. We, you know, we've gotten a lot better at it, but it's primarily been a patient selection issue was, was what drove the learning curve. So the mitral clips approved for degenerative mitral regurgitation, not for, as, as the discussions earlier, um, functional mitral regurgitation. And the COAP trial is answering the question of whether or not this is going to help people with functional mitral regurgitation. And it's completed enrollment and will be uh, presented in the fall at TCT. And I think um, it, it'll be very important because as I move into the transcatheter mitral valve replacement uh, technology, all these technologies are primarily being developed for functional mitral regurgitation. And if COAPT doesn't show an improvement somehow, a clinical improvement in patients, um, it's going to be a challenge to treat them, I think, with a transcatheter device uh, without any evidence from COAPT that it shows some sort of uh, benefit. But here's an early peek at COAP. These are the roll-in cases. So sites that were new to the mitral clip in the COAP trial got to do two or three uh, roll-in cases, meaning they weren't randomized. They, were, they could go ahead and treat them. And remember, these are very sick people. These were uh, people with um, severe uh, heart failure, had had multiple hospitalizations, were refractory to medical therapy after being completely tuned up and evaluated by a heart failure expert. And if they met all those uh, criteria and were not about to die, then they got into the COAP trial. And so uh, here you see at 30 days, um, there were no mortalities. And the other thing I want to highlight is the bottom, the uh, KCQ-12, which is a uh, questionnaire on functional status and quality of life, which is now an FDA sort of acknowledged um, legitimate endpoint. There was a 14-point uh, improvement, which a five-point improvement is considered uh, significant. So pretty um, impressive, but we'll see the rest of COACT uh, in the fall. So what else is out there? So this is the short list of uh, mitral technology that's being evaluated right now. So I'm obviously not going to go through every single one of these, um, but it's a little bit uh, nauseating. But just I'll just point out a couple of things. This little green dot shows the only FDA-approved device, as I've mentioned. Um, the yellow dots are CE mark approved, so just a handful more devices are available in Europe. The red dots uh, are those devices that have been used in patients, and anything without a dot is either a concept, an idea, you know, first you've been used in animals, et cetera, but a tremendous amount of time, effort, and money uh, going in uh, to this field. One of the uh, devices that we'll be using shortly as part of a clinical trial is the CardioBand, which is a surgical-like direct annuloplasty. So it's a transfemoral, uh, transeptal device where you put um, these six millimeter screws in the uh, annulus, and then it allows you real time, as the heart's beating, to adjust, uh, to sort of cinch down 
the device and uh, create a smaller annulus, basically do an annuloplasty and uh, essentially re reduce the um, mitral regurgitation. So this is a case uh, of, from Italy showing a, again, pretty clearly functional mitral regurgitation. This is what the device looks like as it's going in under fluoro, anywhere from 12 to 15 screws are placed transeptally. And this is the first uh, attempt, or the first ratchet down, sort of cinching down this annulus, shows some reduction in the mitral regurgitation, but not uh, elimination. And then uh, on the final um, ratchet down uh, to 4.5 centimeters, you see on the bottom there, you've, you've essentially uh, eliminated the mitral regurgitation with this trans uh, catheter um, technique. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to us is, a lot of these procedures it might not just be one device fix all. It may be a quote unquote toolbox where you have multiple options. You have an annuloplasty, you have a clip, other devices, et cetera, um, that can treat the regurgitation. So here is a case, again from Italy, of a mitral clip patient uh, who came back with uh, recurrent mitral regurgitation and was treated subsequently with an annuloplasty. So they essentially had two mitral clips placed, did okay for a little while, came back with refractory MR, and uh, putting in the cardio band uh, eliminated the mitral regurgitation. So I think using this combination therapy is, is interesting to us. It may be something I think feasible in the future, particularly for these really large functional mitral regurgitation cases with the large annuluses. This is um, not exactly a uh, percutaneous device. This is a transthoracic device um, that is an image-guided placement of PTFE neocords. So this is the harpoon device. And this, um, again, is echo-guided. And you can see here the, har the name is a little bit concerning, um, but the harpoon comes through uh, the lateral chest wall. It's an apical procedure. And essentially, a hole is punched uh, in the mitral leaflet with a little knot on the other side of it. And then that cord, uh, in real time, again, under transesophageal echocardiographic guidance, is um, tethered down uh, to the outside of the heart based on the elimination of the mitral regurgitation. So here's a case uh, post-harpoon um, procedure showing elimination of the mitral regurgitation. So, that's it for the uh, repair um, techniques. The replacement, again, as I mentioned, has, has really been a challenge and I think will remain to be so because of the complexity of the mitral valve, mitral apparatus, annulus, et cetera. Because as we saw um, in, in Dr. Lowry's uh, talk, it's a very complex three-dimensional dynamic structure. And it's not a simple thing is to just go put a uh, device in there because of not only where to land it, how to land it, but also other things in the neighborhood like the left ventricular alpha tract and the subvalvular apparatus. Much, much different than a TAVR. It's not doing TAVR in the mitral position. The aortic annulus is a relatively predictable um, structure. The mitral annulus and mitral apparatus is much more complicated. And here are the um, potential issues with annular-based uh, tricuspid mitral valve replacement technologies. Device embolization, the whole LV load uh, during systole, it has to be somehow absorbed by these uh, devices, and some of them can overcome it, but that's been an early uh, limitation. Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is a significant uh, concern and one of the issues that we address in pre-procedural planning. Device fracture and impaired LV function um, are things that have been overcome subsequently. Here's an example of CT pre-procedural planning on the left showing a uh, minimal LVT, LVOT obstruction and, and a case that would get accept, be considered acceptable as opposed to on the right where you get significant LVOT obstruction and a case that would not be acceptable. Access for these um, procedures has varied. Ideally, um, ultimately, the procedures would be done transeptally with uh, minimal morbidity. Here's our, uh, one of our first cases um, that we did with the uh, Intrepid valve as part of the feasibility study. Um, this is a uh, valve that has two uh, layers to it, an outer conformable stent, and then the inner stent is the valve. So every, every valve is the same size. It's a 27 millimeter um, uh, bovine valve. And here is uh, the procedure, again, TEE guided. This is, again, a functional MR case. The valve's positioned in the left atrium, then brought down, and during rapid ventricular pacing, um, positioned and deployed. 
and immediately after deployment, assessing for uh, valve function and LVOT uh, obstruction, which there's none, and a side-to-side -side showing a uh, good result uh, without any significant MR. The early, the first 50 cases as part of the uh, pilot study were presented at TCT. Again, just highlighting that 72% of these cases were done in functional MR, which is still remains an issue whether or not this is even going to be a benefit in those cases. But a 75% uh, one-year survival. Most of the procedures are obviously have been successful, 30-day mortality of only 14%. And a lot of these concerns we had with the device long-term as of yet have not uh, come up. So the TMVR landscape um, remains pretty broad, and there's a lot of uh, different players in the field, but the uh, 12 device is the one right now that has the only ongoing uh, clinical trial. Uh, a couple of the other unique ones, this, this Tendine device is a similar valve, but has this apical tether um, that, that is in a, it designed to sort of, A, prevent um, embolization, and B, to stabilize the valve. And this is an example of a Tendine case uh, with a 3D rendered post-procedural CT. So you see down here uh, the little tether uh, going into the apex with that um, stabilizer. Uh, as of now, though, this device is, the clinical trial has not started, but the first 30 cases as part of their uh, global feasibility study were presented. Again, 80% secondary MR um, with 83% um, uh, survival at one year. The last uh, two devices I'll show you are, are just kind of cool concepts. Um, this is the High Life, which takes advantage of the success we've had with the valve and ring. So the valve and ring procedure is when someone has, you know, 10 or 15 years down the road, a degenerative repair. We've had a lot of success with going and putting a balloon expandable valve inside of the uh, ring because the ring acts essentially as an anchor. So it's a two-step procedure. The ring is actually deployed transfemorally, uh, arterially, so retrograde across the aorta. The ring wraps around the leaflets, and then once you have a, a grip on the leaflets, you can deploy the valve either transapically or transeptally. And here are two cases, uh, one done uh, transeptally, one done um, transapically. The last is the really cool one, uh, and this is, this is beyond concept. This has actually um, been used, and this is the 4C. This is a, a device that just sits in the atrium. It doesn't, there's, not, there's no disruption to the mitral valve. It's, uh, I mean, it looks like an a, um, orange, and it, it, it's a self-expanding uh, valve that sits in the atrium. So if I can just show you this one video, and one thing we're really good at at interventional cardiology is making these animations that make everything look simple and effective. <laughs> but um, so here's a, uh, a big uh, transeptal catheter. And then, and the other thing about this potentially, if it works out, it's simple. You know, the mitral clip is not exactly simple. TMVR right now is not exactly simple. This is just dropping off a device in the left atrium and then pop, and you have a working valve. <laughs> exactly, I wish. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so it's made out of this uh, self-expanding um, uh, material, so it can be squeezed down to only a 12 or 13 French uh, device. Here's an actual uh, case that was done, which will show what it looks like um, sitting in the left atrium with a functional valve with no disruption to the mitral inner apparatus or the left ventricle or anything else. So in, in closing, um, you know, it's an exciting time, but it's a challenging time to work in the uh, mitral valve. Um, we're dealing primarily with really sick people and still using large bore catheters, which come with their own limitations. Imaging is, is coming along, but is not there yet as far as guiding our procedures as far as an open procedure. And ultimately, I think we're getting a little bit of an innovation overload, but things, as, as I've shown you, are exciting and have a lot of potential. Thank you.